All right, thank you and welcome back. Um, I'm going to introduce five uh, panelists right now, and uh, you don't want to listen to me, so I'm just going to read very short bios. Uh, but first, I have to give you my in-between topic stock tips. So when I was a portfolio manager for about 20 years, never once in the history of my career did a conversation go like this. We would always get calls from brokers that were selling shares, companies were issuing stock, and they wanted us to buy their shares. We had $8 billion, so we were, we were a big client. So it's like, this company is raising money. Do you want to buy some shares in this company? And never once ever did a broker tell me what the prior share issue from that company was. So they would say, XYZ company is raising money at $20. Do you want to buy some? And I would sort of punch in my Bloomberg and look at a few things. It's like, well, four years ago, XYZ company raised money at $30, and now they're raising money at $20. This is not the way it's supposed to go. So if you're looking at a stock and maybe one of you got a new issue, just take a look at when was the last time they raised money and at what price. Uh, companies need money. There's nothing wrong with raising money, but there's something wrong if you raise money at $10 a share, and then three years later, you raise money at $5 a share is not the way it's supposed to go. Um, so it's also been proven that women are better investors than men uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, men get their egos involved and they tend to double down on mistakes because they're more right than the market um, and it doesn't work that way either. So I'm um, pleased to introduce a panel. Um, I'm introducing Paula, Paulette Filion, Judy Parody, Barbara Stewart, Rita Sil Silvan, and Ellen Roseman to the stage. Paulette and Judy are partners at Strategy Mar Marketing, a consultant agency which aims to bridge the gap between what women want from a financial advisor and what is actually offered. Rita is the editor of Golden Girl Finance, a digital magazine aimed at empowering women to become financially savvy and independent. Barbara is one of the world's leading researchers on women in finance and is an advocate for women, diversity, and financial education. Uh, Ellen Roseman is a famous Canadian journalist, needs no introduction, and she is going to be our moderator for today's panel. Thank you. Thank you. Since I am the moderator, I think I'll start with a story. I'm a journalist too. And I was looking at a bookstore, and I found a book that told a story about a millennial in her mid-30s who was a lawyer earning a good amount of money, but swamped with student debt and mortgages and couldn't manage her money and didn't really see a way out because she was working weekends and Saturdays and she just couldn't get ahead. And she didn't know anything about money management or investing and didn't know what to do and finally appealed to her dad, who was not only uh, in the money management business, but he'd written a best-selling book called Rule Number One. You know Rule Number One, Warren Buffett? Don't lose money. So his name is Phil Town, her name is Danielle Town, and she went to him and she said, I know that you work in money management, but I hate it, I can't stand it, it's boring, it's scary. And he convinced her to take a year and every month work on a different aspect of it. He's a big proponent of Warren Buffett and value investing, and that was the genesis of her book. And it's called Invested, but since then they have a podcast called Invest Ed like investor education, invest ed, and they've got 250 weekly episodes. So it's kind of interesting. I think that she goes really way too heavy on the, I hate it, it's boring, it's math, it's scary, but I guess she was creating some drama. So supposing that she's somehow typical of some people in the marketplace and that she's a woman and she finds it all very intimidating, I'd like to ask all of you, and you can just jump in, what are the barriers that might be holding some women back from investing? Because I think the statistics show that fewer women are investing on their own than men are. Shall I jump in? Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Barbara. Um, I'll also share a story. So I do research and I interview very accomplished women around the world. And I also speak at various banks, stock exchanges. And one night I was speaking for the NASDAQ in Stockholm to a, a group of 2,000 women, all young women like yours, who had not really been investors. And NASDAQ, of course, wanted me to encourage them to invest. That was the whole point of my speech. So at the end of it, I challenged them and I said, now go out and buy a stock. Everybody go out and buy something that you're interested in. That way you'll be more likely to follow the company and let me know how you do. And so this one woman who was sitting there was an industrial engineer. She knew nothing about finance whatsoever. 
And she thought, okay, what am I interested in? And she thought, in Sweden, you know, we talk a lot about gender equality, but um, there are no gender equality funds. This was 2015, only four years ago now. So she thought, okay, well, it was a challenge, so I'll do my own research and I'll find 10 companies, she was ambitious, that have gender equal senior management running the firm. She found the 10, she put them all these stocks in her little portfolio, and she tracked the performance over two years. And because she's young, she was totally into social media, and every month she would tweet the performance of her gender equal portfolio against the S&P 500. And guess what? It happened to outperform. And she started getting calls from banks wanting her track record, because by then, two years later, everybody wanted a gender equality fund. And it became so interesting that to the point where Business Insider magazine did a story on her called The Swedish Amateur Who Outperformed the Stock Market with Her Feminist Approach to Stock Picking. And from there, she actually ended up quitting her engineering job because she saw the demand. And now she runs a data analytics firm that ranks Swedish companies based on gender equality. So I love, sh I love to share positive stories. So there's one for you. Is this okay. on? Yeah. OK. Oh, OK. Um, so we Ellen, sorry, you I, asked I, the question, oh, yes, though, yours. and I, I think oh, that okay. was a great answer. But you asked the question about you know, what women can do and, and why they don't invest as frequently as men. And um, one of the things Paulette and I frequently talk about from the women that we interview, and I think you'll probably have the same experience, is that women are time stressed. They're often looking at, you know, looking after family, kids, parents, uh, they have careers. And unless the financial community makes it easier for them to relate, to connect, it's, it's very, very hard. They, it's all sort of part of their lives. It's not like, well, I'm going to go and invest, and, and then I have my life, and then I have my job, and I have my kids. So I think it's a matter of accessibility at the level that they want accessibility. Yeah. Rita, uh, you have a website, I and do. a lot yeah. of women say they don't know where to get started, mm -hmm. and your website's all about women, right? Yeah. So um, how do you make it welcoming? Okay, first of all, do I need this or not? No. Okay, <laughs> just important to know. Um, yeah, so it's really interesting because uh, many of the, the women who are subscribers to, the, to our site, Golden Girl Finance, I, I hear very similar comments come from them, and they fall into a couple of buckets. One is they feel they don't have enough money to get started in investing, right? And I, because I, I think many of us, the younger, it's different for I think younger generations, but I think older older women feel like that to be an investor, you've got to be like, sorry, I have to mention his name, Voldemort, Donald Trump, but you know, like you, you've got to be, uh, you know, a really like aggressive, uh, already very wealthy man to invest. And that if you have a small portfolio, you got to wait, save until it's larger in order to invest. And I don't think that's true. Your point about being time stressed is really relevant um, there was an Australian study done not long ago uh, looking at women who had become widowed or divorced, and more than 50% of them said if they had known how important it would, it would have been to get involved in the household finances and investing, they would have done less housework. <laughs> you know? uh, so being time stressed is a reality because there are so many urgent things that women often have to do in the household. Uh, and then investing is something you can always put off, especially if someone else is saying, oh, I'll take care of that for you. Um, and then I know we're going to talk about financial literacy, but that is absolutely uh, a crucial crucial factor. Um, again, many studies have shown that for both men and women, um, the higher their level of financial literacy, the more positive financial outcomes they have in their lives. Mm -hmm. Paula, investing. you and Judy have just put out a book, Invest in Her, The Smart Financial Advisor's Guide to Winning Female Clients in Six Easy Steps. It's a nice short read, mostly designed for people in the industry. But don't you feel that sometimes the people who work in the industry, who work mostly with male clients, make it harder than it needs to be? They use a lot of jargon, terms that people don't understand. They show charts. And maybe they're more about just beating the market, beating the index, as opposed to what women want. And so what do women want from an advisor? <clears throat> well, I think women want somebody who will listen a lot. Uh, and oftentimes, I mean, the industry does not 
um, make it very welcoming to women. And that's exactly what they, they've told us. Uh, studies in the UK, studies in the US also show the same thing. Um, they want somebody who will speak a language that makes sense to them. It's not about you know betas and alphas and uh, whatever else. Uh, they want to know how this portfolio is going to help them get to their goal. And their goal might be putting their kids through school, or their goal might be paying off their mortgage, or their goal might be you know having a retirement income, whatever that is. And the industry has uh, has has done a poor job in terms of making. And when you were talking about. Um, uh, women don't know if they have enough money. The industry doesn't make it easy to say, okay, if you're an investor and you've got this much money, here are your options. You can do it yourself, you can use a, a mutual fund salesperson, you can use a, an, in, uh, an investment advisor, you can use a financial planner, you can, and here's what you get and don't get with each one of those. And I think the industry has to do a better job of uh, making it more inclusive for women. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about this topic that's out there, and it's very controversial. A lot, certainly when I started writing about investing, it was felt that women are risk averse, meaning they take less risk than men do, and they find it very difficult to invest fully in stocks because they could lose money. Now people are saying, well, it's partially a function that they don't earn as much, you know, and anybody who doesn't earn as much is much more averse to losing it. And also, once they start getting into the stock market, into mutual funds, equity funds, whatever, that they can take just as much risk as men and they're just as confident as men, but it's just a question of maybe being a beginner. So who'd like to talk? Barbara. Well, I'd love to talk on this. It's my favorite topic. And the whole reason I started doing my rich thinking research 10 years ago was because that whole risk of thing drives me insane. And I, I think it's just very wrong and it's a stereotype that we need to bury as quickly as possible. So the reason I interview accomplished women around the world is that I want things to be positive for the next generation so that we don't have people growing up with these demeaning words. Because actually, if you do talk to women, and I've worked 20 years as a portfolio manager, I'm a chartered financial analyst, and a researcher, I've interviewed over 800 women around the world now, so that's pretty statistically significant. And I can tell you that the common trait with female investors is that they are very risk aware, not risk averse. This is a positive skill. We need women to be risk aware, and we have them, so they, that's why they make really good investors. And so what I do see, and why maybe this stereotype existed in the first place, is if anything, we as women tend towards perfectionism in everything that we do. Rita and I talked about this on the subway here. And so a woman might spend more time looking in the details of what she's going to invest in. She'll take her time She'll do her homework. She'll do a really good job. I guess this is a good thing, again. Um, but she will take calculated risk, absolutely. So the job of the industry, as we're talking about, and the onus on the investment industry, is to take the time with her, and there's the rub. You might not get the payoff right away, but you will get the most loyal client you'll ever have. Because when she does invest, she sticks with it, because she understands it. And so, again, this is a very positive trait for women. I agree. Yeah. Uh, no, f absolutely. I mean, there are so many studies now, um, very, very large, well-documented studies uh, showing exactly how it is that women um, have the financial advantage in investing. And, and one of the key factors, to your point, Barbara, is this awareness of risk. And that then uh, means they, they take different sort of actions. Mm -hmm. It's a long-term view. They tend to be much less reactive to market volatility than male investors are. Um, they're not trying to time the market. Uh, and this is, of course, a way that, um, unfortunately, people who do, whether they're men or women, lose a lot of money in transaction fees and tax. Mm -hmm. and just errors you know of judgment because you've got to be right twice going in going out um, you know which is which is an issue so women's outperformance there was one study here I'm just going to quickly quote it from uh, the Haas School of Business at the University of California in Berkeley looked at 35,000 households over a six-year period and found that women investors outperform male investors by almost 100 basis points you know mm -hmm. which is a mm -hmm. lot yeah. over time and when you put that number together with the long-term focus. 
and trying to achieve not so much an absolute return, but achieving a return that feeds certain life and financial goals, that's when the magic happens. And, and this is why over time, women generally tend to be better investors, whether they're professionals or retail investors, by the way. So across the board, women tend to be, generally speaking, uh, much stronger investors than men for these specific reasons. I think some of these biases <coughs> happen because women ask a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. So when they are working with a financial advisor, they don't just say, oh yeah, that sounds fine. They'll ask a lot of questions. And that, the financial community is, has sort of interpreted it as they're not as smart. They, they're, you know, they don't know what they're doing. And that's not the case. Like mm -hmm. you said, it's the, the risk of not risk averse, but they're risk aware. They want to know. So they ask a lot of questions. Yeah. So it's a good thing. Financial advisors may not like it because you can get a, a male perhaps to invest right away where the, the woman might want two or three appointments before she's ready. Mm -hmm. But then once they're a client, it sounds as if they'd be a better client because they're not going to panic and sell on those days when the market goes like this. Is, is that your research? Yes. yes. I can tell you that on the worst day, the low of the financial crisis, I had a, a full client base of maybe about 50 clients. I got seven panic phone calls that day trying to get out. Every one of them was a man. And I had half and half in my client base, lots of couples. And luckily, I was able to talk each one out of it, which is ultimately the job of the financial advisor. That's what it boils down to. Um, but I found it really interesting, again, why are they the ones being worried more about the risk? And, and the female clients, for the most part, this is a huge generalization, obviously, were much more kind of like, how are you doing, Barbara? How are you, how are you handling this day and this period of time when you, you know, having trouble paying your own mortgage? You know? okay. Paulette, why do you think women are less panicky? Uh, when it comes to market slowdowns? Is it because they think more long-term? Absolutely, and uh, they're big believers in financial plans. So once you've got a roadmap of uh, where, where you are, where you're going, and how you're gonna get there, uh, it makes them feel much more comfortable. And they've been told, you know, the markets will go up and will go down. So when it happens, they're not surprised, and they're not, they said, somebody told me that was going to happen. But uh, to share a story of uh, Judy and I met a financial advisor who um, was very, uh, he was telling us this story that he had been very stressed. Uh, all his clients were asking him, you know, better rates of return and this and that and the other thing. And he decided to focus on women because he liked working with women. And he found that he was not only happier, uh, but his clients were happier because he felt appreciated for everything that he did, not just in delivering a rate of return. Uh, but he spent the time explaining things to them and he spent the time understanding where where they were in their lives and what was important to them and where they wanted to go. So it, it's both sides of the equation. And there are financial advisors out there who do like to work with women. And it's a matter of finding the one. Now, they're, they're not the majority, <laughs> I'll tell you that. <laughs> Uh, but it, it's important that women, because oftentimes women are much more comfortable using the expertise of someone else uh, at the table uh, when they're investing than trying to do it on their own. And there are people out there that do like to work with women, so it's a matter of finding them. So when it comes to financial planning, if you're going to pay someone to do a financial plan, someone who doesn't sell products, that's in the neighborhood of 2000 plus, right, which is a lot for anybody to contemplate. Then if you want someone to manage your money after you do the financial plan, then they will do the financial plan as a loss leader, but then they might be selling you very high fee mutual funds. So where is the spot for a woman who doesn't, who wants a financial plan, who thinks it's important, but doesn't necessarily want someone to give them these high cost mutual funds and, and the kind of service that maybe isn't, you know, uh, the best service because a lot of these people are just getting those trailer fees every year? Well, I'll, I'll tackle that. <laughs> uh, I think women have to be clear on what it is. You can't show up like you're, you know, please help me, I don't know what I'm doing. You have to be clear on what's important to you. If education is important to you, if you want to learn about this stuff, then you need to find a financial advisor who's going to spend the time to help explain things to make sure. It's finding that right match and not 
Yeah, it's this, uh, Judy and I often use the, the example of it's like finding a, a husband. I mean, you don't necessarily find one at the first guy you meet. You may have to kiss a lot of frogs in order to get the one that, that makes sense for you. But at the same time, be clear on what's important to you. I want someone who's going to help me understand how what I'm doing is going to help get my kids through school or pay down my mortgage. Mm -hmm. if, and and the, the, the clearer you are about what's important to you, because you're the expert on you. <laughs> and the advisor can build a portfolio that makes sense for you. If you don't want to buy mutual funds, if you think those aren't really the ones because they are high fees, <laughs> then you can say, I don't want to own mutual funds. I mean, you can be quite clear about what it mm -hmm. is. You, you shouldn't show up. Like you're, you know, you're, you're just, yeah. yeah. And I think to reinforce that, women have to go into with the perspective of I'm interviewing this person. Because I think a lot of times when you have an, uh, an appointment with an advisor, they think, oh, this is a new client. They think it's a done deal. And you have to make it clear that I'm interviewing several and you have to be prepared to walk away. You have to be prepared to say, and women don't generally like doing that. And sometimes advisors can come on really strong and you know, you'd be stupid not to pick me. Um, so they really have to be prepared to say, I am making, like you said, I'm the boss, I'm in control, this is my money, and I'm going to select you know, who I want to work with. So I hold out until you find someone that you're really, really comfortable with. I'd like to chip in. I do, and I'd also like to say a lot of people get confused because they think it's the firm they're dealing with that matters. And I can say, from my perspective, working in the industry, the firm doesn't matter. I've worked with really small niche boutique firms that are very cool. I've worked for one of the major banks, and I've worked for mid-sized independent firms. And the, the common denominator was me. And I think that, you know, the banks are not safer than anywhere else. It's who you're dealing with. I really believe that strongly. And so to the original question about financial plan, pay the $2,000 for an independent not associated with anywhere. Let's plug Rona Bierenbaum, who spoke earlier. I've used her with almost every client. She's fantastic. Pay the money. You get what you pay for totally in the industry. Pay for independence. And then secondly, um, I've got to say, I'm a chartered financial analyst. It is the highest designation in the industry. I would look for somebody with the CFA designation. Right out of the gate, you know you're getting the person with the highest qualifications. There are other good people, but that's going to take longer to find. Go with the best. I would just like to add something to that as well that, um, you know, it's not like any of this uh, information is, is a secret. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of information out there for free or nearly free as well. Granted, not everyone has the time or the inclination to acquire it, but I mean, just read the Globe and Mail every day. Um, you know, you can take an introductory course at the Canadian Securities Institute. You can attend workshops that, uh, you know, are not sales oriented, but that are uh, oriented to, to investor education. And, and so there's a lot that people can just learn on their own. Whether you then decide after you still want to work with somebody, that's great. You're going to be in a much better position to pick the right person for you, understand the jargon if that's part of the conversation, and you won't get rolled, or there's less of a likelihood that you will get rolled. And I'll just add that I'm speaking from my own life experience because I came into this world with this much financial knowledge. That's a zero, zero. I come from the world of fashion publishing, so let me tell you, uh, you know, anytime we had to do pagination or budgets, everyone in the office would be freaking out because it's like we don't do numbers. And then I went from that place of I like, well, thank you, <laughs> as close to zero as, as a person can really go and still be sort of financially functioning, yeah, um, right, exactly. to saying, you know what, this is a big gap in my life. And I really want to understand this. I didn't think I'd go as far as I did. You know, I kind of overshot. But the fact is, I really want to know this because I realize this is a very important life skill and I'm missing this chip and I need to understand it. And so I took the courses. I read the Globe and Mail. I listen to podcasts. I am constantly educating myself. And I would encourage everybody here to do the same, even if you decide you're going to work with somebody else. 
get some basic knowledge under your belt, you'll, you'll make better decisions, and you own that knowledge forever if, if you've acquired it. But I think it's great that you came from there because mm -hmm. I came from there as well. Mm -hmm. I'm in advertising, mm -hmm. so 30 years ago I knew like literally nothing. And it's important to have come from that to be able to then understand um, where people are. So, you know, I had kids, I had a business, I had money, but I knew nothing about it and literally was afraid. I had an advisor who said, no, no, you're not paying any um, uh, fees, <laughs> and I believed him. And I had no reason not to, and I just sort of thought, you know, this is a world beyond me, I, I can't deal with this. So, but he, and I have to say he, made no effort whatsoever to connect with me as a human being, and obviously he's not an advisor for me anymore, but uh, it, it's, I think you're probably so understanding because you come from that mm -hmm. side, and we know what people go through, and it's, it happens still, so yeah, take the time to learn. But, but know also that you're not going to learn everything overnight. So give yourself a break. Uh, it's not going to happen instantaneously. But as and you're never going to you know, stop learning. And either. you're never going to stop yeah. learning. Mm -hmm. So uh, start with whatever time, because I know everyone's pressed. So saying, mm -hmm. go attend a seminar, or go do this. Yes, oftentimes you can, but just pick something, anything. It doesn't matter what it is. Sure. Just pick something. It doesn't something. matter where you start. Right? That's yeah. right and just start to become more aware. Talk to your girlfriends or, or your friends about uh, how they invest, what they do, how they do it, where they learn, uh, and then just start, because if you whittle at it one, you know, once uh, a day or once a week, you'll find that all, all over a year or two years or three years, you will have learned quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Just Plus like a husband, you have fun. to sometimes go through a few financial advisors <laughs> to find the right one. Back when I started, I was at the Globe and Mail, and all of a sudden I was covering mutual funds, and I'd never owned a mutual fund, and I thought I'd better buy one, and the one I was interested in was only sold through brokers. So I just called somebody in the phone book, right, an ad. I got his phone number, and he was pretty good, but six months later he'd moved on, and they assigned me someone else. So I thought, okay, now I've got someone else. And then I noticed that when he would call me, as soon as the, he'd start talking, and if I didn't know what to say or if I was a bit slow off the mark, he'd just talk right over me, and he just kept talking, talking, talking. And finally I realized like he was just somebody who didn't really like silences, and that's not good. So you have to kind of negotiate with different people and figure out what your style is. The question I have is, is there any advantage for women who are starting out to have a female advisor or not? I don't think so. Um, there have been studies on this. I don't think it's really that conclusive. Um, I think there are really good male advisors and really good female advisors. And the common denominator is their ability to communicate in a language that makes sense to the client, whether that's a female or a male. So what we do know about female communication styles are that they prefer to learn through imagery, stories, case studies, documentaries, podcasts, panels, discussion groups. So if you're communicating with a woman, there's got to be more of that. And a lot of male advisors today get that, and they didn't get to be so successful without getting that. And because we've seen such an explosion in the social trading space and social media, Globally, it's even easier for women to communicate in their preferred style of communication. So you want to have fun. You can go in Facebook communities if you want to chat and get social. We've got a startup in Canada called Volio, and it's very interesting based on, go on their site, volio.com, I think it is. E-O-L-I-O. V-O-L-E-O. -E okay. Uh, Thomas Beatty started it in Vancouver. They've gone public on the Venture Exchange recently. It's based on the concept of investment clubs. Women love investment clubs. Why? You get to go on there, talk about it, invest as a group with your old MBA class or your, just your friends or your family. And women have more than one investment club, he told me. Okay. And they're at least half of the people using the, the site now. So it's fun. There's a lot more exciting ways to learn how to invest just in the last five years. If anyone wants to join an investment club in downtown Toronto, there's one called Ellen's Investment Club, <laughs> which is a spin-off from my U of T continuing education courses. It's been running for 10 years. I have at least one member in the audience and someone else I saw recently. And we meet once a month at the uh, at Bloor and Spadina at the, the JCC. 
Um, and uh, we charge $10 for room rental. And it's not all women. We have a good group of both men and women, and we just talk, we have speakers, and I can tell you that people feel better because it's hard to do it on your own. Investing often requires some courage, right? You have to go against what the guys on BNN are saying and what the market's trying to tell you, and you have to hang in. And it's really nice to have a community of some kind, whether physical or online. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a good point that you make about your class uh, or your club having male and female. Oftentimes, uh, there's this notion that uh, that you think women need it one way and men need it why another way. But we've found that uh, once an advisor takes on this much more listening and speaking the language of, of human beings rather than of the industry uh, and talking about goals, men also prefer it. Uh, and they start relating more to the money in a more positive way and not just about how big is my pile. Uh, so it benefits both, both parties. Absolutely. I think it's a great point that you make that, uh, you know, we, we often, we talk about, oh, the, the industry doesn't really service women very well, but really, in, in truth, it doesn't service anybody <laughs> uh, very, very well. And maybe women are sort of at the vanguard of, yes. of initiating that change and demanding something yeah. different. Well, um, men are less likely to say... Yeah, this I don't isn't understand. working for me. I don't understand. <laughs> it's like, I know where I'm going. Um, and Ellen, your point I thought was really interesting about the clubs and, and as well, um, you know, this, this, uh, the venture startup, because so many, um, so much research shows that when it, when women, um, have someone else to talk to, friends, colleagues, uh, you know, family members, they're much more likely to have the confidence, because that comes up a lot when we talk about women investing. Um, because, they, they'll, for example, women have a greater tendency to invest in real estate. They're more likely to pay down their mortgage or, you know, they're more comfortable because they can talk to somebody and say, what do you think about that property? What do you think about that house? Should I do this renovation? Unfortunately, and I know it's changing rapidly, which is great, but it's harder to have that same conversation about investing with your inner circle. There's it's changing, yes. and these clubs are helping, uh, and they're much, uh, a catalyst for that, but you just don't have that same automatic network. I know I don't have with my friends. Like, what do you think about that investment? I think there's still a taboo. Is they're like, not, oh, I don't know. You know, taboo around talking about money, talking about investments. And somebody said to me the other day that they thought with younger people that's falling away. Yeah, yeah, is. yeah. That there's more uh, willingness to discuss. This is how much I make, and this is, yeah. you know, how yeah, much I just. There's these online yeah. diaries now where people detail their spending. There's yeah. one called Refinery Twenty mm Nine. -hmm. In Canada, yeah, people like to read about, you know, where your, your spending goes, and a lot of bloggers are seeing what they invest in too. Wow. Yeah. So let's open the floor to any questions or comments from the audience. Uh, Lana has a microphone in case you you need some amplification. Yes. thousand dollars a year and has no interest at all in investing. So my question to you I was to Planners or analysts? Cause yes, I, 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 two different things. They're two different things. And right. what kind of a, a nest egg does she have? Does she have any savings yet?
Barbara, you, you said financial analyst. I have to, have to admit, I don't know how to answer your question. Honestly, I, I think I'd go with the $4,500 option. She's got a good job. It's worth it. As I said, I believe in paying for the best. I've seen too many situations where then people either, you know, even like people who get divorced, they had a terrible lawyer, they end up having a terrible separation agreement, they pay way more for the rest of their lives in spousal support or whatever. Here we have the same thing. If she gets bad advice and then you know, is paying ridiculous fees that she doesn't notice. If she's not interested, she's not interested. So I would pay for the best and get an independent plan done and forego, you know, a holiday or something like that and set herself up for success. Well, I had, my husband and I had a plan done with Rona. So a complicated plan because we're not 26 or 27. So there was a lot of stuff to deal with. And I think we ended up paying around $6,000. But that also meant that Rona had to contact the accountants and she had to look at wills. And there's this corporation and there's that blah, blah, blah. And so it was very complicated. Yeah, so that was the high end. But for your daughter, whose That's life not is year. not too complicated, now is a bargain price time <laughs> to get in before her life gets financially complicated to go in, I concur with Barbara completely, go to an impartial person, fee only. It's an investment in your future self. It's an investment in, your fu in her future self, her future happiness. And I wish, I wish I had done it in my 20s and my 30s and my 40s. I wish I hadn't waited till my 50s to think about it. I would have made different decisions and I wouldn't be here today. I'd be in the south of France. Thank you very much. <laughs> I just want to say that that's the cost of a one-time financial plan. Then she can go off on her own or Rona can help her look after her money, but it's not an annual fee. The other thing is that Rona started a new company called Viviplan, which is like um, semi-automated. So you do it all online or much of it online. You still get phone calls and, and that's $800 for a financial plan. So it brings it down for people who don't want to spend a full, you know, 2000 plus. So that's VIVI. Viviplan, V-I-V-I-P-L-A-N, if you look for it online. Um, and it's a couple of years old. She's got some really good software people putting it together, and she's hired financial planners across the country. Hi. OK, I, I really appreciated the um, insight about folks, like um, two ladies, uh, two of you who are up there, um, starting with very little information um, about financial, um, the financial environment. And from what I understand, um, there's podcasts, investment clubs, uh, a, a, a number of things that were mentioned. And I was just wondering if there were like maybe seven things, the number seven is very important um, in self-help world, seven things that you would, um, resources that you might recommend for folks to check out, like a woman like myself, we're trying to get that knowledge. What might you recommend um, in, in that regard? And I also heard Warren Buffett talked about the intelligent investor, that that book is essential in terms of learning about investing. Um, and I heard it reads very boringly. So I was wondering if you have any other adv advice. Which investor? The intelligent investor. Oh, yes. Okay, that's Benjamin um, Graham. Um, Benjamin Graham, yeah. right. What's that? It's not boring because there's an annotated version by a Wall Street Journal reporter called Jason Zweig. So he kind of puts his notes in there and makes it more exciting. So, and it's, it's one of those books that's always in the bookstore. You go to any chapters or Indigo, and there it is, and it's worth it's worth checking out. I think you can also even find it online for free because yeah. I used to recommend it to my, my students. I mean, I think uh, it, it almost doesn't matter where you start. Uh, if so, you find a particular type of book boring or too dry, well, then you're not going to retain that information. Uh, you know, fortunately, these days, there are so many amazing podcasts. There are so many books that are very chatty and, you know, engaging. And, and they're available for every level of 
um, uh, financial knowledge. Where, wherever you're starting from, there's something for you. There's this amazing resource called the reference library or your local library, and you'll be amazed what you'll find there if you go into the personal finance section or the investing section. You can order the book online. They'll let you know when it's, when it's arrived. The great thing about that is the book comes in, you pick it up, you read it, you like it, you don't like it, okay, mm -hmm. next, and you find one. It doesn't matter where you start. Just start with one thing. And maybe books aren't for you. Maybe you prefer podcasts. Maybe you prefer videos. There are incredible videos on YouTube. Um, I work out to them all the time where you've got wonderful people giving lectures at Harvard University and mm -hmm. Sanford and, you know, incredible places. But I think get together with friends. And yeah, friends. I agree. Get yeah. together. I mean, you're doing the right thing by being here to begin with. But if you find a book boring, then, you know, look at a podcast, but get together, you know, have coffee Thursday nights or something and, and say, hey, you know what, let's devote one night a month and talk to like-minded people that absorb information the same way you do. And, and the synergy is, is really quite, quite dynamic, wouldn't you think? The number one thing, I think, absolutely the number one way to learn is to get started in buying a stock or a fund. So you can sign up for free on Wealthsimple or any of these trading platforms, no fees. Get your hands wet, buy a company, any company, just do it and then sell it and then see what happens. And then sometimes that's addictive in and of itself. Obviously you don't do this with all your money, you take a little bit of money, mm -hmm. but I've seen such success with people who were not interested remotely and then they decided to buy a couple companies they thought were kind of interesting to follow, they start doing it, all of a sudden they've built knowledge, they've built confidence, and they're investors. You're an instant investor, and you don't have to learn everything about it before you do that. You can go home now and open up one of these accounts and get started. That That's the best way. Being the way how, how I got interested in investing, oh, no. because I come from a very um, you know middle class or lower uh, middle class family. No one ever invested in the market. You know, that was just like, pay down the house, that's gambling, don't do it, you know, whatever. So, of course, you know, you're always having to rebel against your parents. But I worked for um, a high-tech company just around the, the tech boom, and so part of my compensation was stock. And then when the company went public, I suddenly had shares, which I probably would never have thought to go out and buy any shares, but I now I had them. And so that's how I had to learn about the market. I had to research. I had to read the business pages. You know, and slowly, little by little, I got completely hooked. And, you know, and now I love it and I consider it a form of yeah, I know you're not supposed to find it entertaining, but I do uh, find investing uh, a delight and, and very stimulating and, and very entertaining as well. Uh, but that's exactly how I got started, because I had skin in the game. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not just about savings. Uh, certainly saving money is, is where, you know, everybody's got to start. But at the same time, I'll agree with the other ones. The minute you, you own something, all of a sudden it, it takes on a different dimension uh, and you become quite invested. Now, hopefully, you don't blow your brains out the first time out because that'll turn start you with off. A small amount. But <laughs> start, start with anything yeah. but the, and then learn about that company or learn about uh, that investment that you, you picked up. But get, start, start a regular savings program and invest. Uh, rather than put it in an interest-bearing account, or which pays nothing. A of it. Yeah. 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 I want to mention this website called GetSmarterAboutMoney.ca. It's your tax dollars at work. The Ontario Securities Commission, when they fine a company, they get a bunch of money that they're not allowed to plow into their own operations, which is seen as a conflict of interest, like the police waiting for you at the, <laughs> giving you a ticket and then using that for their budget. So they have set up this site. It's been around for, uh, I think, 10 years. It's got a ton of information there. It's all written in a very plain way, plain language way. And one of the best parts of it is there's a place where they have a zillion questions and answers. You can ask your own, and then you could look up other people's questions and answers. No names required. And just spend some time there, and it helps you get started. It really does. Get smarter about money.ca, and it's run by the investor office, which is financed by the Ontario Securities Commission. Hello, ladies. Thank you for being there. First of all, I think it's important to be able to see women who are confident in what they're doing and have the knowledge. 
Uh, you asked a question of why women have problems with investments. I think they have probably the knowledge, but I think they lack something. And what they lack is trust in themselves because we don't want to do what's wrong. We, don't, we are concerned of whether we're doing the right thing. Uh, and then we don't want to waste money because we're scared of, of, of be, and we're afraid of losing money. And those fears are sometimes uh, warranted, but sometimes they're not. That fear holds us back. That's why we're, we don't trust ourselves. But you also mentioned where to get information and how to get an advisor, planner, or whatever the difference is. You mentioned there is a difference between planning and maintenance. As somebody that's a senior is already retired, as I get older, I will be looking for somebody that would be willing to maintain um, or help me maintain my financial stability. That's an important factor. It's a little bit different than a planner. Planner will tell you where to go, what to do, stock advice, all of that. My main thing as a senior is to maintain my nest, uh, nest aid uh, until my time is up. But I also like the idea of having an expert to be able to make a plan, a one-time plan for my life for the next five years. And that indeed is worth 3000 4000 5000 depending on your situation. Some of them are very expensive and some of them are not. As you indicated, uh, circumstances in people's lives, there's various factors that come in. It can be complicated or it could be easy. Um, also, what is it? I found that rather than having a financial planner uh, deal with me on a yearly basis, the Globe and Mail is one of the most important tools in my life to be able to read things because I get to meet not just one financial planner, but many that contribute to that newspaper. And you know, that's not very expensive because for $22 a month, I get the advice that I need to have. And I'm confident in making that decision for myself. Then I go to a financial planner if I want to have somebody sell or buy something for me. So that's how I do it. But I think the question comes down to why do women have such a problem? The people that I've encountered that are seniors, they don't trust themselves, and they have that ability. Younger people, I don't know, but at this stage of the game, that's what I find with women my age. And I'm 73, so I'm proud of that. Thank you. Can I, can I start? Can I address that, just the beginning? The interesting thing is, is that when women are, are asked about their financial literacy, women will, will score themselves very low, as you mentioned. You know, two out of 10. Men will score themselves nine out of 10. I know all this stuff. The interesting thing is, is when they take that same group and they actually have a financial literacy test, women do as well as the men. So it's, it's somewhat unfounded, but it does come from our unconscious biases. There are things that are ingrained in us. It happens today still in grade two. You know, girls are not good at math. Girls are not good at tech. Um, so that's something that we all, as women, as men, as parents and, and caregivers, really have to consciously make an effort to change that paradigm. And that'll take a while. Um, but again, I think you said earlier that women um, lack confidence because they want to be really good. They think, I'm not good enough. I need to learn more. Your second point about you only want somebody that um, uh, maintains your, your sort of nest egg, well, I think it's as simple as, and correct me if I'm wrong, is to say to whoever you meet, this is what I want. You know, I want somebody that will maintain what I have. How do we do that? Okay. This will be the last question. Uh, in the front here, yes. You. Oh, okay. Is that online? Okay. Somebody's saying that you can get two dollars a month for the Globe and Mail. No. Online version. 
Okay. Okay. I think a it's, woman should have the last word here. <laughs> okay. Yes. It wasn't a question. Okay. No. Okay. Do we have any more questions? Last yeah, question? Let's, let's, or do you want to keep responding to that multi-part the question? The Globe and Mail? Or? No, no, the other one. <laughs> <laughs> About women having faith in themselves. Oh, there's a question Sorry, there's here. A <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you, Ellen, for being here. You got me interested in investing, and I used to be a regular reader of the Toronto Star and then moved over when you weren't doing your finance column any longer, moved over to Rob Carrick at the Globe and Mail. So thank you very much. Um, if I were to look around the room, I wonder how many people under 50 are in the room. And one thing I see at these conferences is the lack of younger people being here, and I'm thinking of my children. And um, what you folks, with your wealth of experience, could do to encourage younger people to start managing their own money and to think about saving, and um, what kind of things that you see yourselves doing to get into the school system and get kids involved. And I see this as a priority since pension funds are no longer what they were um, and that my generation might retire with these nice pension funds um, and, uh, and younger people won't. So they need to have this knowledge. And I think we're behind the curve. Thank you. Uh, thank you. This is my life work, and I believe strongly that we need that. And that's why if you go on my site, barbarastewart.ca, I've shared, you can download for free, I'm on my 10th annual white paper, which quotes 50 women, young and old, and middle, from around the world, sharing really inspirational stories about some aspect of finance. And those stories are put out there for the reason that I want to inspire the next generations and make it a positive thing to invest. So if you need a resource, that's one right there. And um, I can't tell you how much these stories have changed so many people's lives around the world. So. Back to the story I was saying earlier about Danielle Town, who hated investing and only uh, worked with her father because he kind of twisted her arm. What got her going wasn't the idea of investing, the idea of helping change the world with her investments. That's, you know, socially responsible investing, going for the companies that you think are making a positive difference. So that can be with the environment, with mining, with a whole bunch of things. But in general, women tend to respond more to socially responsible investing. So the industry is producing a lot more products. And that can be a way to get younger people, especially with the March on Friday and Greta Thunberg. And that's a great way to get young people involved. And I think, Barbara, just having more role models out there yeah. um, makes it a lot more accessible because you begin to see yourself uh, in a role model that, that is already doing exciting and interesting things compared to my generation where I did not see those female role models in investing. All of my investing heroes up until recently have been men, middle-aged men, or, or in some cases, almost, they're almost 100, <laughs> and we know about a couple of those, um, Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett, for example. You know, these are my heroes, so I would, I'm happy to have them as my heroes, but I am also looking constantly to expand my, the, the group of mentors out there for myself, and the more women that I can reach out to and look and say, wow, she's done it, she's done it, I don't have to be a pretend guy to do what I do and enjoy what I do. You know, I can, I can do it in a feminine way, in a womanly way, because I have those role models out there make me feel comfortable being a woman doing this. And okay. it's the job of each one of us mm -hmm. to make sure that uh, we, uh, we reach out to younger people and say, this is important, this is your future. Mm -hmm. And whatever way, I, I've always uh, given, you know, get them interested in doing something, anything. Because if they start saving, if they start investing, it will only grow over the years. But if they don't, if they don't, if they wait till they're in their 50s, then they start panicking, yeah. and they don't know. Uh, it's hard to catch up at that point. So and as last word, I'd yeah. say you can't start too young. My uh, daughter-in-law and son have two boys, and they started from the time they were 
five years old and they got an allowance and they said, you know, you have to divide it up, you save part of it, part of it's for charity, part of it you can spend. But they started doing little tiny investments when they were like five, six, seven years old, literally. So they understood that it, it, the money can grow, that it can do something. You don't just buy candy, you know? Yeah. So that's, that's a really valuable lesson to learn at a very young age because people think, parents, we're all guilty of it. Oh, they won't understand but kids are quite remarkable. And they'll take that to school and all the other venues, mm -hmm. so. And uh, I'll just add one more thing, Paula. You mentioned saving a couple of times uh, during this panel. And I think it's really important to remember, you've got to know how to save. You've got to have some savings so you can invest those. <laughs> As a point. whole other panel. Um, <laughs> but it's, that's something that's so important for people of, uh, of every age, but especially young people, is to just be aware that you need to have savings in order to invest them. So I think it would be good to have a panel of young women next year yeah. inspiring with their <laughs> investment stories because yeah. that's very attractive to other young women. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Well, thanks yeah. very much for coming, everybody. It's been a great discussion. Thank yeah. our panelists.